Welcome to the show. This is Sir Michael Norton, the most incredible behavioural scientist, uh, professor of behavioural science at, uh, at Harvard Business School. Um, and I think you, you teach behavioural science and well-being in the marketing department. Is that right? I teach lots of different things. And that's <laughs> part of the, yeah. Brilliant. It yep. teaches everything at Harvard um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and has written this brilliant book called The Ritual Effect. I got to meet Mike at, at Nudge Talk this year. Um, he was giving a brilliant talk. If you haven't watched Nudge Talk, uh, Google it. You can watch uh, Mike's talk there. It's, uh, it's fantastic. And the other uh, thing Mike's very famous for is he, he invented the IKEA effect, which uh, I'm sure IKEA must give you shares and, uh, and free furniture on a, <laughs> I on wish. a daily basis. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> but so lovely to, to have you on the podcast. And thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, to join us. Thanks um, for the invite, Chris. I thought I'd start off with just trying to figure out, like, how did you get into writing this book? You, you, you normally do a lot of stuff around behavioral science. So was this, how did you get into this? What, what made you think, oh, rituals? Yeah, I'd love to study that. Like, get into I that. will say when I told people I was starting to study rituals, they were like, is he, is he okay? You know, is he, <laughs> what's going on? Like, cause it is a, you know, the word itself is conjures up all kinds of things. But um, uh, I co-wrote pretty almost exactly 10 years ago, a book with um, Liz Dunn that was called Happy Money that was about, um, it was a little bit about like how to structure your life, but a lot of it was really, what could you do with your money today to get more happiness out of it today? You know, if it's $5 or five pounds, what, what should you actually go and do with it right now? And so we were really interested, and Liz got me interested in that topic, really interested in these little everyday actions that aren't, you know, change your career, get married, not the big things, but these little daily things. And I think part of the germ for studying rituals was actually that. I didn't really come at rituals from the religious rituals or the cultural rituals that have been around for a long time. I actually came at it from the people telling me these funny little things they did when they got out of bed or their teams at work or, you know, at dinner with their family. All the what they did when they were nervous about something, you know, all these little things that people were doing, that I think was what hooked me. And I'm a social psychologist, so it's like humans doing unusual things is hmm, that's like our favorite, you know. So that was the the very start, and then it just kind of ballooned from there. Where if you talk to anybody about rituals, they say, "Hey, have you ever looked at rituals in this domain?" You know, romantic couples. You say, "Oh my god, we haven't." And they say, "Well, let's do that now." You know, so it really just kept building on itself and building. And then I finally said, maybe I'll write a book and try to summarize it. it it's interesting because, I mean, it, I think like you just said there, I always thought rituals were the kind of, I think even the definition in the dictionary is it's a kind of somber or religious event. Um, so I guess is, is that kind of it, the way that I use the word rituals in my own life is definitely not necessarily just true to that definition so has it how has it evolved because i i guess we're not so religious anymore uh generally speaking it's sort of yeah how how's have they revolt re, re, have they evolved or how have they evolved into something that was perhaps more religious into something that that we use in our everyday lives now yeah my hunch is so obviously i'm not the first social scientist to study rituals has been very very long amazing cool research but it was mainly focused on the kind that you just were talking about, the broadly held cultural rituals. So I don't know if people had these funny everyday ones then. Do you know what I mean? They, I yeah. bet they did because humans yeah. are humans, but it's almost like we're missing them. So it, it, it can feel, I think, that we're now burgeoning with these new rituals, but I'm not 100% sure. But the thing I will say is it, they're incredibly ubiquitous. But almost no one does no ritual. In fact, I can say that as a fact. No one does zero rituals. It's just not possible to be a human and not do rituals. And so as a topic, that's just fantastic because yeah. you can really go anywhere with it. And what, what would your sort of definition be with you know, the sort of the difference between something that's maybe a habit to something that's a ritual? You know, as a, your previous question made me think one definition of a ritual is actions that you engage in that have no instrumental purpose. Okay. 
which is a very weird thing to do if you think about it. So I'm Catholic, for example, so the sign of the cross, it doesn't do anything exactly, but it but it's very important to people, you know, of faith to do that. Mm. Actions like that where you're not actually getting something physically done in the world, like lifting a spoon to your mouth and eating the food on it. In a sense, that is the framework around rituals where you say, My gosh, people do all of these very, very weird behavior. I mean and I mean, by the way, weird affectionately. Uh, yeah. And lovingly of us, you know, we do these very unusual behaviors, and they have so much meaning often in our lives. The, the big cultural and, and religious ones, and the little ones that we do with, you know, our kids and with our spouses. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I, I think in the book, actually, you write something that was quite nice. I noted it down. Let me see whether I can find it quickly. Um, <laughs> habits get you through the day, and rituals make the day worth remembering. Which I thought was a lovely, a lovely kind of description description uh between the two yeah i do um, see I, I i do see um just to be super clear habits yeah. are great <laughs> yeah. good habits are fantastic you know i mean i wish i had better habits but i started to feel like you know a life of perfect habits isn't necessarily a rich and interesting life you know if, if you're doing the same exact thing every single day mm. you'll be really really healthy but would you say what a great, interesting life I've had. And I do think one of the things that kicks us out of our everyday, got to get the thing done, got to get to work, got to do this, are rituals, in fact. Both the cultural kind, you know, so you're married for 50 years, how do you celebrate? Well, they told us on your anniversary, you're supposed to do something. And also, by the way, on February 14th. So they remind us sometimes, let me go and do something that's not the regular thing, because this is important to you. And that, I think, is such a useful feature of them is that they bring out all of these emotions and all of this meaning that otherwise I think we get a little lost in the, oh, God, here we go again. You know, I got to do this and I got to do this today. So, I mean, if you've written a book on rituals, you must have a million of your own or, or <laughs> what, are, what are some of your favorite? Do you have? A... I, I will say if, if you're listening and you say, I don't have any rituals, ask your spouse, ask your kids. Ask your coworkers, and they'll be happy to list <laughs> a whole bunch of things that you do. Um, one of my biggest ones actually was when we had our daughter, um, we came up with an extremely elaborate bedtime ritual. Sleep, you know, is the most important thing when there's a baby and the parents and everything. And so we, we didn't sit down and say, hey, why don't we write out a ritual to make sure that she'll go to sleep? It just admit parents have this experience it just kind of happens it's just sort of it used to just be that book but now it's these two books <laughs> it used to just be one stuffed animal but now it's four seven songs the songs have to come before the stuff you know what i mean they get really really elaborate and really complicated and they come out of us it's like in stressful moments in life often humans turn to rituals not in a hey everyone let's sit down and write out a ritual but we start to bring them to bear in our everyday lives and i did the exact same thing. And again, I was already studying it and I didn't even realize I was doing it until later when I had to almost look at myself like I was a stranger. Like, what the heck is that guy doing at night? You know, what does that have to do with getting anybody to sleep? For me, it felt like this is a big deal. I think this is helping her. That's so interesting because I guess we all fear the unknown and particularly, I guess, when you, when, you know, just had a kid, we were talking about it earlier you want to try and make sense of the world. So I wonder whether it's the rituals that create comfort, because even if they're just made up, it kind of helps us make sense of the world. I, I, if, if you done looked at the sort of research behind that, is there's is, is like rituals as a comforting mechanism. They often are, if you look both historically and also in everyday life, they often emerge in times of uncertainty when people feel a lack of control. And there's very few experiences in life that make you feel you have less control than bringing home a newborn. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's kind of a, a thing that behaves in ways and there's nothing you can do about it. And I did, I think I realized, first I realized we were doing a ritual to help her sleep. Then later I had a second realization, which was, I'm not sure this ritual is for her. <laughs> I think this ritual is for us. So we feel like we are, who knows if it helps her sleep, but it helped us feel like, okay, We've got it. You know, we can do this because we have all the books out. You know, we have all the stuffed animals. We've got this. And I do think parents often rarely test the efficacy of their rituals. 
you know, you don't swap out a new book every day and measure which one works. <laughs> you yeah. just kind of develop it and go with it. And I do think it's often for us instead of for these newborn. It is, it's interesting in the book, I think you note, it, you, you note that in a few different ways. I remember there's some, some examples you were saying, I mean, sports people are famous for doing rituals before they go on to play games and things. And then there was this great experiment you mentioned where if I remember rightly, they had a group of pigeons or birds and they put them in a cage and just randomly fed them. And before that, they were always fed on a particular thing. So if they tapped a button, they would be fed. And then this other set were, when they tapped the button, nothing necessarily happened. It was just randomly the thing would notice. And then you, you, you're saying, well, I don't know, you probably explained the experiment better than me. I'll stop. Um, no, that's, that's exactly it. Yeah. You know, you train them to peck the button once and then hit the peck the lever and food comes out and they learn that and then they keep doing that and they keep getting food and as you said in this particular case whatever they tapped had nothing to do with when the food came out it was completely random so what pigeons should do is just sit back <laughs> they should realize it's random and just relax and get the food when it comes out and that's what we should do too, by the way, is we should just <laughs> relax. A lot of things are random in life. And you know that we don't do that. And the pigeons didn't either. They started coming up with, I think we could loosely call them rituals, which is, you know, four times on the button, wait a second, then hit the lever. And they would just keep doing it repeatedly. And each pigeon came up with their own. <laughs> so there's like innovation and creativity in pigeons even in <laughs> what sort of behaviors they use to try to control the situation that... The beauty of the experiment, of course, is we know it's completely uncontrollable. And yet, pigeons, and not to single them out, humans also engage sometimes in these behaviors. It, it, it's, it's, it's so mental and fascinating. But, I mean, I <laughs> guess there's this, there's this kind of growing link between maybe rituals and well being or rituals and making sense of the world. Like, are, are there any. Can you elaborate maybe on how rituals can enhance mental and emotional health like uh, for, for people? Other? Yeah, I think so. A few years ago, unrelated to this, actually, um, Jordi Koidbach and I, with other co-authors, started studying what we ended up calling emo diversity, which we extremely regret calling it that. <laughs> it's not a good name. <laughs> but the reason we called it that, it sounds like an emo band or something. You know, it's not good. <laughs> so that's a regret in the career. But But the reason we called it that is because it was based on biodiversity. The idea that, you know, if you take an island and try to figure out, is it a healthy island? You look at the number of species, you look at their relative abundance, and you see if it's kind of a little bit in balance. And we thought, what if we do the, actually, I shouldn't say, Jordy thought, what if we do the exact same thing with our brains, with emotions? It's an ecosystem. You've got all these different emotions at different frequencies and different intensities. Let's measure if just the variance alone is important over and above feeling happy and those other things. And that's what we see, actually, is that there's something about having highs and lows and feeling happy and sad and nervous and calm that makes our lives different than if we just feel all the same thing all the time. And there's tons of ways that we insert emotional variance into our lives, like, for example, having a baby <laughs> or going to a scary movie. You know, there's a million ways to do it. But one of the ways that we do it, humans do it, is with rituals because we use them to generate like any emotion you can think of, some group of people or some person has done a ritual to try to generate that emotion. You know, like sports teams use them to amp up and also to calm down. We use them at weddings and we use them at funerals. You know what I mean? The idea that the same thing is used across all of those situations is insane. You'd think we'd have different things for different situations. But that to me is the link, actually, that rituals do prompt often different emotions than we can otherwise access sometimes. And I think do contribute to the idea of a rich and interesting life. So fascinating. I, I guess that for, the, for the purpose of this conversation, a lot of our audience generally are, are you know, in, in the creative world or in marketing. And are there any rituals that you can share from, from that industry that you found particularly interesting or particularly good? Like, are there some categories that are just really good at rituals? And in my head, maybe I think drinks like comes to mind a lot like wine and guinness and certain ciders but what are some of the more interesting ones that you found in, in your research one thing that's um funny as i mentioned kind of you, you later you notice you've been doing rituals all along 
but we have a lab group here, which we also not very creatively named Nerd Lab. <laughs> But it's a bunch of faculty and postdocs and students who all do all kinds of different topics, but behavioral science broadly defined. And one of the things that we've done in that group for years and years is we have a day every so often that's called Random Ideas Day. Love it. And Random Ideas Day is you have to bring an idea about humans. That's the only thing. And the, the key is you're not allowed to then study it. <laughs> The only thing that you do that day is present ideas and brainstorm around them for five minutes and everybody does it. And then we just clear the decks and carry on and do other things. And I realized the reason we're doing that is because for the fac me and the faculty in it, the most important thing for us is creativity. It, you have to be good at statistics and you have to be good at designing experiments. Of course, of course, you have to be a great scientist, but without the initial idea, without the creativity. so. We inserted a ritual, in a sense, into the work group that specifically tried to communicate the exact value that we all held in common. And that's very common, actually, across work groups in general, is you know, if the, if the work group is all about cohesion, they have a ritual that's around that. But if it's all about innovation, they have a ritual around that. And you talked about you know, companies on the consumer end. When I give a talk on uh, rituals in the consumer domain, I click through, I don't even know how many slides of products that not just use rituals in the how you consume them, but are called ritual. <laughs> right. Literally the word ritual or <laughs> ritual something or something ritual. And I mean, you know, prenatal vitamins, coffee, clothing, anything you can think of, non-alcoholic uh, spirits. People are using this word because I think it has some kind of emotional resonance that at least marketers believe is capturing attention in a different way. We're not 100% sure that it's doing that, but whenever you see something emerge across all these industries on the consumer end, it's like there's something in the zeitgeist that's making us feel like this is the way to go. It's, I was doing a presentation actually the other day about there was an overview of can lines, and one of the big things this year was one of the big themes this year was around humor and, and the power of emotion in advertising. It's just basically saying the more emotive you're advertising, um, the, the more effective your advertising is. Um, it, it's more effective at increasing your profit margins. At if you, it, it means your, your brand is more resilient to price uh, rises mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder if, if I think about all the rituals that are brilliant that come to mind, they're also they're often very very emotive so that would kind of fit with that other research that sort of it becomes more emotive which means then it has a a, a better effect on the business um what are, what are some of your favorites from from brands around the world there's a, an amazing one that it's un, i doubt the brand started it but now the brand has, i shouldn't they may have but i think it emerged from culture and then the brand started to but very simple one which is oreos the twisting of the Oreo is very satisfying and exciting for people. And it's just a cookie. I mean, I happen yeah. to like them, but that's irrelevant. It, it is, in a sense, just another cookie like all the other cookies. So how do you make it something that's much more immersive and involved and interesting? This twist, it's the time it takes one second. But what's amazing is not only do people like doing it their way, but they get upset if people do it differently. So now you've got like competitions, like, no, our way is the good way and your way. I mean, idiotically, why would you eat the filling out before? You know, I mean, people get really interested and, and uh, excited about twisting a cookie. And it's a rich, you don't need to twist the cookie. You can just eat it. And yet this little tiny step completely changes the experiences altogether and provokes joy and anger. And, you know, I mean, a really wide range of emotions based on this tiny, tiny behavior. I, I know they, they've used that in a lot of case studies as well. <clears throat> it's um, it's an incredible example. Um, and yeah, they're 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 they're. I think you can get Oreos now in the UK, but yeah, it's a big big kind of US thing. Um, what what do you think brands or individuals can do? Are there any steps that you can do to try and make your own habits, or if you're a brand and you were trying to make a, a habit that was linked to your product or something? Are are there any tips that you often recommend like you know 
can start here and then do this or or is it totally random i think um so the message of the book is not the more rituals you add to your life the happier you will be and we could talk about how too many rituals of course can be bad for your well-being because they start to take you over instead of helping you feel control but it really is domain specific so there are people who engage in more rituals and fewer rituals but often it's really they do them in this domain and that domain and nowhere else and frequently when we look at which domains people choose to do them in it's something that they're working on or struggling with we bring them to bear when we need them in a sense so families that naturally just have fun at dinner don't have any rituals necessarily <laughs> families that might struggle often hey at the beginning of dinner from now on we're going to do this Right. So you can see how when the need is there, then people bring their creativity to bear. Or some people really have no performance anxiety. So I wouldn't tell them like, you know what you ought to do is come up with a really elaborate pre-performance ritual to calm <laughs> yourself down because they're already calm. So you look to see, you know, in your own life, where are the spots where these might help out? Leaving work behind at the end of the day, easy for some people, really hard for other people. So kind of doing an inventory of your day and seeing where you could at least try out an experiment with something like a ritual and then see what happens after you do it. So I guess look for perhaps pain points in either you, your own journey, your, things that you're trying to accomplish, or if you were looking at it from a marketing perspective, perhaps pain points in the customer journey, and then apply your creativity and see whether there's something that's related to that product or that moment that can be linked uh, to create a, a ritual that will then get people over that friction. But that one of one of the things that uh, I've done some work on is um, helping people wait in line. Right. So if you think about one of the worst things, if you have people rank the Hang worst on. things, I'm, I'm English. We love queuing. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of uh, amusement parks, for example, the yeah. five-hour line to get yeah. on the thing, and um, it's a very ritualistic thing, actually, you know, waiting in line. We, right. we culturally agree to do it, even though we don't have to. You know, I mean, it's fascinating as a social scientist. But then some companies make it more and less interesting along the way. So Disney is an example where often their things are happening in the lines that are related to the overall experience. So they're kind of, which is very ritualistic. So they're kind of tying the lines into the broader narrative. Still, nobody likes waiting in lines, obviously. It's not like magical. But you can see how when you bring these elements into the pain points or the boring things, you can get a little bit more happiness for consumers than if you just have them stand in a line and nothing happens ever. I remember when I think we've got something in one of our behavioral science courses on, on queuing and how behavioral science has tried to, to sort of uh, prevent frustration. I think one of them was like just putting mirrors up. People love looking at themselves. It's yeah. like basically you're giving them something to do, I guess. <laughs> it's like, and um, itself, it's, you know, yeah. we're obsessed with ourselves. So it's yeah. fantastic. Look at, right? look at me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned something actually a little bit earlier, which I thought was interesting. You said sometimes we can let rituals almost hinder us like a kind of OCD or something. Um, I I can definitely think of some things that I do in that where um, I, I I kind of it almost prevents me from doing things like oh I can't go to bed until I've done X Y and Z. <laughs> you know, there's no rhyme or reason for it. it doesn't yeah. really make sense. But like you know, I need to do this one thing. Um, if you find people get stuck in those situations, are, are there any recommendations you have for how to kind of break that addiction? One of the things um, I'm not a clinical psychologist, so I apologize. Right to the people who are trained. But one of the things that can happen with something like obsessive compulsive disorder, often we're engaged in rituals in the service of something else or in order to do something else. So you're doing your X, Y, and Z, which you'll have to share with us because that's very intriguing, but you're doing, you're doing your X, <laughs> Y, and Z in order to get to sleep. Or people are doing going into the bathroom and talking to themselves in the mirror in order to calm down before they do a presentation. So there's often this link between do the thing in the service of something else. You might double check that you locked the door in the morning when you're leaving for the day because you, you kind of feel like you need to do it, but that way you can leave your house and have a good day and do whatever you want to do. 
what can happen with obsessive compulsive disorder is you lose the link between the ritual in order to, and you start doing the ritual in order to do the ritual. So now you're checking to see if the door is locked for an hour and it's interfering with what you wanted to do, which was go out and have fun with friends or whatever your goal was. So one of the ways that um, you think about diagnosing OCD is, is it interfering with other things in your life, other goals in your life that are important to you? And if it does start to interfere, that's the level where we might say, let's think about pulling them back a little bit. But if you need to do X, Y, and Z before bed, and it takes two minutes, it's not interfering with your sleep. If each one of those took an hour, we might start to say, hey, that's going to interfere now with the whole goal. Let's think about how we might change that. Yeah, it's, it was for me, it was really random things. We, <clears throat> we do um, in our courses, we, we live mark a bunch of stuff. So I'll always try and look through uh, like a bunch of the marking that we've done that day just to sort mm -hmm. of sense check, like was our feedback right? Like was everything fine? Are there any marking waiting? Is there any things waiting to be marked? And it, <laughs> but then sometimes I go down a total rabbit hole. So there's one like very simple task which should take me you know, like a couple of minutes would end up then I'd go like, oh, actually, I wonder about this. And then I'd start watching a YouTube <laughs> video about something else. And like an hour later, I'm like, yeah. oh, God, I still haven't gone to bed. And like, <laughs> I've got to get up so early tomorrow. What have I done? Um, so now I just try and remember like not to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, or if I do do it way earlier in the evening. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or a distinct stopping point. Right. Yeah, so you, yeah, yeah. you know that After, you're going to. After midnight, you're not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's a good one. Um, I I was also interested for for you know, we we've got a bunch of courses that we've done on on um, leadership and team building and things like that. I thought it was interesting that you mentioned rituals from an organizational perspective. Um, I'd love to get your your you know share some of the you know one or two examples and any any advice that you you would have on that. Um, so there's some great stuff in the book around that. The first thing um, that comes to mind in the workplace when you say the word ritual is like corporate retreats and trust falls and stuff <laughs> like that, which is almost as bad as waiting in line, <laughs> you know, in terms of how excited people are about it. And uh, those can serve a purpose, which we could discuss. But the kinds of rituals that we uncover in our research are often, again, not the ones that are mandated from on high, but the ones that people come up with themselves in one way or another. And we see lots of work teams who have their own kind of subculture and they have their own little rituals of how they do things. And this team stands out to me. I'm not exactly sure why. It's, it's not the most interesting example, but I think it's telling in the fact that it's not that interesting. So they do lunch every day as a team. And the only thing they do is... There's five people on the team. So Monday is your day, which means you buy lunch for everybody. Tuesday is my day. I buy lunch for everybody. And we, we have a very strict schedule and we always do it that way. We're always going to eat lunch. It's just putting food in your face. <laughs> but what has this team done with putting food in your face? Now one day a week, I'm taking care of everyone on the team. And every other day of the week, the team's taking care of me. What are they trying to do with that value? Just like our random ideas day, we're saying creativity is the value that we care about. This team is saying support is the value that we care about. We're going to be solid for each other. And you know how we know that? We've been doing this lunch thing for four years <laughs> and never missed a day. You know what I mean? So it, it, these little rituals that teams come up with themselves, and we do see, in fact, that those are correlated with your sense that your work is meaningful. Nice. which is a really nice feeling that we long for in our lives, that the work we're doing is meaningful. And we do see teams that report having these kinds of um, behaviors or activities are more likely to say that their work is meaningful. It correlates a lot. I remember when I was still at Ogilvy, um, I looked at research into how to conduct meetings um, more efficiently because as he as you know, <laughs> loads of uh, loads of time is wasted in meetings. And <clears throat> and there was a brilliant study from Google. I don't know whether you've read it, and they found like wh what were the most effective meetings. And the the assumption was that the most effective meetings would be the ones where they immediately get to the point that they want to get to, and they get out of the room as fast as possible. And what they actually found was the most effective teams in all of their meetings 
<clears throat> they would spend the first five minutes just going around and asking everyone how they were doing. Mm -hmm. And it relates a lot to what you were just saying. It's kind of that giving that 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 sort of understanding that we care for each other, we care for yeah. how we're doing, and yes, we're here to do a job, but yeah. actually how are you? <laughs> What's going exactly. On? And it is, um, it is it are we just here to do a job? Right. Or are we here for other things as well? And I think rituals often you don't have to have them, but often teams use them, I think, as a we're here for something else as well. You know, I'm going to be, we're going to be in this team for six years. L let's figure out some ways to, you know, get to know each other. And there was a, I took to heart one of the things that, that you put in there. Cause it was, um, it was brilliant. The, <clears throat> the, I think you give an example of a company that was about to go through a merger kind of happens to everyone in their careers. At some stage, someone buys a company or you get merged with some other team. And it, more often than not, it tends to not be super harmonious. Um, but you, you, there was one team that did something really wonderful. I can't remember exactly what it was, but would you mind? Can you remember the one that I'm talking about? Yeah, I think so. With I mean, mergers go wrong for 5,000 reasons. So I, I don't mean to say rituals are the, the thing. But this research does show that uh, with this kind of a very deep dive on this one merger, that one of the best predictors of whether people thought it was going well was keeping some rituals from the old company and keeping some from the new company and then coming up with some new ones. So you're not just dismissing the entire culture of the other company. So how do you show that you value the culture of the other company? You can say, we value your culture, but how do you back it up? Well, we're going to bring your culture in here and we're going to do that funny thing that you do at the beginning of meetings. We're going to import that in over here. And by the way, it's the same with blended families. So, you know, when people get remarried and they have kids, they had their family rituals around Christmas, for example. Now we're all in the same house. What are we going to do? Huge conflict, huge conflict. The most successful families take some from there and some from there and then come up with some of their own. And so I think it's... Um, getting stuck on them again can be very counterproductive. Even though we think of rituals as fixed and unchanging, in fact, we're freelancing on them all the time. We're changing rituals all the time. And that opens us up a little bit to try to think about, hey, what do we like from that? What do we like from that? And what do we want to do that's really just about us? It makes those, and <clears throat> you mentioned their families. It seems like there's, there's a big thread in that book. And actually even reading some of the reviews around the book, thing that seemed to have been really impactful for people is the, the the rituals around around families and death and like big sort of personal moments um it's it's yeah it's such an interesting thing i think you gave that great example in the in the talk at nudge stock you were saying you know has anyone ever gone through a breakup and uh, and then found out that your other half is using a ritual that you used to do with <laughs> with the new partner. It's like the worst thing in the world ever. You hear, like, you can feel the rage coming yeah. off the audience. Actually, the the <laughs> idea that a, a human could do that is so <laughs> unacceptable. <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's really were there, were there any um, yeah are there any sort of tips that for for relationships um, and creating rituals that you could share? Cause, um, in the you, same way, I think. The book, Couples that create rituals together stay together in a way. I think um, in the same way that when you look at work and you say ritual, people think like trust falls in corporate retreats. If you say ritual to couples, they think date night. Right. And that's what we'll do. We'll do a date night every Friday with something, something. And date nights can be great. I don't mean that they're, that they're bad. But for example, if neither of you are really interested in food, why would you make food a central part <laughs> of your ritual together. It doesn't make any sense to do food if you're not into food. So, so we really ask couples to think about what are the things that you really love to do together. That can be something that you start to structure a ritual around. And my, another one of my favorite examples in the book, because it's, again, so small, is a couple that said, every time before we eat, we clink our silverware together which is just like so lovely for some reason. It's so yeah. lovely that they do this every time. It takes a second. It's just that they do it every single time that it starts to become meaningful about what they're sitting there. They're celebrating 
each time. It's like clinking your glass. We're celebrating sitting here and eating leftover burritos or whatever we're eating. It's still a little bit of a celebration between us. So, so the advice then would be, <clears throat> if if you if you're in a relationship and you don't have any rituals, <laughs> make some quickly, and you'll be more likely to stay together, even if it's just clinking uh, the silverware. Uh, we can't do the, the it, rituals are funny because the, the research we'd love to do is randomly assign people to romantic partners and then <laughs> randomly yeah. assign them to come up with a ritual or not. Turns out, not allowed to do that in the world. Yeah. So it's with rituals, it's funny because the the best research is often undoable. And so mm. we do end up looking for associations or correlations. So we can say couples that have rituals, it's a very strong predictor of being happy in your relationship. But that's not a domain where we can say six days after you add a ritual, you're going to be two points happier kind of thing. And it's literally because the research is hard to do, not because it's, of course, we'd love to know the answer to that question. Could you do it in your class? Could you just say at the beginning of a semester or a term or whatever they're called uh the person who they're sitting next to they like half the class have to have a little ritual and half the class um like that's their assigned seating and half the class don't have a ritual and then at the end of the year do a, a confidential survey and see like which ones which side it. of the class like the I people they're sitting next to the more it's um, great yeah one of the things about rituals is you need a captive audience so yeah. like parents can make their kids do rituals because the kids are stuck there right. <laughs> and bosses can make employees do it because the employees are stuck there. <laughs> Teachers also can make people do stuff because we're the teacher and you're the students. But most places in life, maybe fortunately, we don't have that set up. So I can't just tell a group of people, hey, I want you to do this funny thing, you know, for the next year. Yeah. But if you're stuck in my class, I really like your idea. Let us know how the experiment goes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I know I've taken up lots of time, so I thought I'd, I'd finish with two things. One was like, you know, we're living in an increasingly digital, fast-paced, crazy world. Um, yeah, how how do you envisage the world of rituals evolving? Do you think we're going to find more of them um, going forward, or or less than? <laughs> I think what we've seen. So when. Um... You know, in, in 2020, when the world changed and many people's, in a sense, all of their rituals got immediately disrupted, you couldn't have funerals, you couldn't have wedding, you know, every single thing that we did, now we had to do differently. And you could imagine that what we would do is say, you know what, those really weren't that interesting anyway, let's just ditch them. And that is absolute, absolutely not how humans responded. They said, well, we got to make do with this. How are we going to do it over Zoom? And they came up with a new way to do the wedding and a new way to do the funeral or the birthday party. And to me, that really shows how deep they are in us, that it's not that we'll just give them up, we'll adapt to whatever's happening around us and try to find ways through technology, if we need to, to still have some of these elements in our lives. It's super powerful. I hope that... Um everyone listening gets to go out and find some brilliant rituals and, and to, to end i thought i'd ask you a, a silly would you rather uh, we sometimes do these on the a ritual themed obviously so would you rather have to sing your entire shopping list to the tune of your favorite song every time you went shopping maybe just grocery shopping or perform a ritualistic dance before every meal when you're eating out at a restaurant so you either have to do a dance before you're eating at a restaurant or sing out your entire grocery list uh, before you go shopping nobody wants either of those to happen <laughs> <laughs> not just me uh i think i would pick singing because dancing feels maybe that's wrong it felt more noticeable that you'd be <laughs> engaged in dancing that was where my mind went what could i try to get away with under the radar i think i you might go with singing but i'm not sure that's a, that's a tough one you you could get away with a little jig and that could be a dance yeah like, <laughs> That's true. i i don't know I'd, yeah i wonder i wonder whether dancing is the more subtle one um but yeah fantastic answer and like, I, I really really appreciate your time uh talking with us today so yeah thank you so so much for coming thank on you the it's really great to chat thanks